All righty, and welcome to Further Every Day, the podcast where we explore current events through the lens of the Christian worldview. I'm your host today, John Arthur Fiala, and uh, we're joined by a special guest. But before we get there, we've got Miss Nikki in the chair of uh, theology. Hello, how are you? Doing well. Glad to have you there. Clint in the chair of philosophy. Howdy. Steve in the chair of culture. Hey, man. How's it going? Glad to have you there. And we got Josh in the chair of politics. Hello. How's it going? Doing well, and we are joined by a special guest today. Uh, he wants to go by the pseudonym Well Informed. How are you, Well Informed? Yeah, well, pretty good. Glad to have you on, sir. Real quick, could you tell us a little bit about your background? Well, I did uh, six years in the United States Navy. Hired out on a railroad in a mechanical department as an inspector. And I went to lead inspector. I've worked there for uh, almost 40 years. And I got put on disability. All right. So today we're talking about the Ohio derailment. And we've got a whole batch of questions for you. And so I, I kind of want to start off with just laying the groundwork for those who've, who've had their head in the hole for the last two weeks and have missed everything. So th there was a derailment in Palestine, Ohio, and Correct. they decided with this derailment to burn off, I, I believe it was five cars of vinyl chloride, and this has created an environmental disaster. And so I want to get your, 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 your thoughts just opening up, if you have any, on the, the, the issue of derailment, because there's a lot of diff differing reports about the amount of time spent on inspections, the amount of time spent on, or it, also the size of the rail, rail cars. What would be your opinion as to what all happened and what went wrong? Well, I've uh, worked a lot of derailments since day one. And uh, what went wrong is you didn't have one person in charge, for one, if you're speaking about the gases, you had uh, too much input from uh, fire department, the EPA, the mayor, the chief of police, trying to tell the railroad how to do their job, and the railroad more or less threw in, threw in the towel and said, okay, we'll do it your way. So that's a really interesting statement you made. You're saying that primarily government interference may have been the reason for the expedited igniting of the vinyl chloride. Correct. So for those who don't know what vinyl chloride is, uh, it's, you know, polyvinyl chloride, PVC, is a plastic that's commonly used, but this is one of the active ingredients there. When you light it on fire, in addition to uh, uh, a couple of other off gases, you get phosgene gas. And for those who don't know, that was used in World War II. It, the way it works in the body is it creates a, um, a layer of foreign substance on the alveoli in the lungs and you were no longer able to breathe when you're exposed to large amounts of it and a lot of a lot of people a lot of people die well a lot of animals died and a lot of people are suffering from respiratory difficulties since then what would be a typical response to a derailment like this well a typical response would uh let the railroad handle it because they have their own hazmat team and uh, let the railroad take charge, and they, each person from each department, whether it's the government, the EPA, the mayor, or that there, should just appoint one person instead of a whole group of people all getting their input and sit back and talk to situation before they jump on it. Yeah, too much input, too much confusion. Because that does seem like a strange thing, doesn't it, to burn off the tankers? Well, the, you see, they should have used uh, foam. I know foam ain't good, but foam would have smothered it. Then the foam, nothing would ex would escape that foam that they used. Then uh, you could walk through the foam, bust up foam, and it would absorb it. And it would have worked a lot quicker. That's what they use on uh, jets, aircraft. When they have a uh, burn off an aircraft, they fire the uh, hoser down with the foam. That's what they should have done. But nobody would uh, pay attention, you know, to the railroaders. It, it was just mass confusion. 
So, any questions from the room? I know, I know, I've got some of your your gears turning. Yeah, man. Um, this is Steve here. Um, now, what happens? What's the problem with doing it the way, say, like the fire department did, with coming in there and spraying it down with with the water like they did and trying to put out the fire. What what kind of problem does that create? That creates a problem. That's where you start getting runoff. And the fire department, you got to look at this. It's a volunteer fire department. And uh, myself, I wasn't there, but I get the report across the computer when it happened. And uh, <laughs> it was a mess, you know, I mean, a big mess. You have, you have too much inexperience versus experience, and the inexperience outnumbered the experience. So, and, and then you end up with the uh, environmental hazard, right? With, say, like all in the water system. And, and do you happen to, I, I know you're, this isn't probably your uh, expertise, but uh, with this kind of uh, hazardous problem with, with running it off with water and trying to smother it, do you have any idea the the length of time or anything what this is going to do in the environment that it takes for this to like dissipate in the environment or does it ever? Well, have you guys ever heard of what's going on at Camp Lejeune? No, we haven't. Oh, you haven't with the uh, contamination in the water back in 1953 all the way up to 83, where now the lawsuits are finally sailing. The railroad, this, this is going to be drug out over a period of time. And uh, when, it get, you know, when it gets into the blood system or your children, your animals, yourself and your dog, it's just a matter of time for you. It's just a matter of time. It wasn't uh, very good. I was actually, um, I'm glad you brought that out because I've, if you watch television a little bit, you'll see these advertisements that pop up for Camp Lejeune and these mass class action lawsuits that are now in, that are now happening as a result of the, uh, the incompetency and the, the problems that resulted from uh, the contaminants in that scenario. And so I think you're pretty much on the money there mentioning, bringing this to what we're seeing with this derailment in Ohio is that ultimately we're not going to really know until months and years down the line, but the effects could just be so devastating. That is correct. So the next question I, I think, I think we have is from Ms. Nikki. Well, I was just going to ask the question of, um, my husband is an insurance adjuster and I, I know that railroads are going to carry insurance and they're going to have certain policies that they're going to have to follow. And now that we had the government interfere, I'm just wondering how this is all going to play out if what you're saying is you had all this, these people that interfere and they didn't follow the protocols that were set in place by the railroad. Now, is the railroad really going to be held responsible because the government interfered? See, the railroad will have their responsibility, their part. And uh, getting back to the insurance, the railroad is self-insured. They don't carry a have a carrier. They're self-insured. That's very interesting. Because because of things like this. You do not have workman's comp on the railroad. Workman's comp will not take them because of the accidents. Yikes. Can so, I ask one more question? Please because do. Because you, you, yeah. um, you were an inspector and you were you know, in this industry for 40 years. Do you feel overall that really the most people in the industry are responsible or what would is you, what's your opinion after 40 years well I'll, I'll give you a real good one they have all these schools that they send you to to train you they have to according to the government and all this is on a computer and the government sees it you went to all these schools air brake school inspection school derailment school hazmat school and, but the thing is, when you come out of them schools, it's a burden to them to let you do your job correct because uh, people have been told numerous times, myself, 
we make money serving freight. We don't make money repairing cars. We don't make money inspecting cars. We make our money moving freight. So that's a really interesting interesting response, and that leads me to the question here. John Arthur speaking here from the producer's chair. I just wanted to ask you, so there, and this is really hard to state and, and, and hard to say, and feel free to, to say you don't know, but the response was, for the, for the reasoning for burning it was it was the safest method. That just does not ring right to my ears. What do you think the real reason right. was? Was it expediency? Was it was it an issue of, of politics? Both speedy and politics. They wanted to get that rail open. And there were politics involved in that too. And they wanted to yep, get that main line. They could have rerouted everything around there, you know, rerouted the traffic. But they wanted to get that rail back in service as soon as possible. And politics played a big role in that. So would you lay part of that at the feet of the uh, Secretary of Transportation? Yes. He does not know his job. Think about this. He doesn't. <laughs> Look, what, what are his qualifications? Because he was appointed. Does that qualify him? Yeah. He doesn't know anything about trucking, shipping, railroads, airlines. Whenever you have a mishap, he kind of disappears. Or he has to consult all the people that work under him, and they try to put a puzzle together and come up with an answer. That is really, really, really a sad indictment that I'm hearing. Josh, Josh wants has a question. Uh, yeah, I just, this is Joshua. Uh, I just want, I thought it was so interesting what you said there, the, the speediency and the negligence, and also what you said, what you learned from the school, and how that's a very popular opinion that we don't make money repairing uh, cars. We, we make money moving the freight. I work in logistics and transportation, so primarily OTR, 53-foot dry vans, and uh, also expedite, 26-foot uh, straight trucks, sprinter vans, all that type of stuff, reavers. And that is also something I can confirm that that is a very popular sentiment among not only uh, the companies that move the stuff, but it's also a, a thing with drivers. Because if drivers aren't moving it, they're not making money either because they get paid usually per mile. Uh, and Or if you're an owner op, I mean, that's the rare circumstance, right? You also make money moving your truck and you can't really make money if you have to get something repaired. So you typically put it off as far as possible and you don't take the proper measures to ensure that everything is safe. Well, so, the railroad, well, here, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Please do. The railroad has indicators and cameras on a rail. When they have a problem, that indicator will pick it up like a bad wheel bearing, bad wheel, safety appliance, draft gears, truck sides, wheel hunting. And they'll go through that mark and it'll send off a signal. Now, if it goes through the second one, and it sets it off again, they're supposed to stop that train, pull that car out, and put it in the siding. But that's what they're supposed to do. But uh, <laughs> a lot of times, well, do you think it'll make it to the yard so we can get that train in here and, and get that freight separated and get it going again? Do you think it'll make it to the yard? So they dump that on the engineer. And here, if you try to buck the system and do your job right, they're going to mess with you. They're going to nitpick at you. They try to get you fired. They're going to play games with you. They do not like that. Somebody that tries to do their job right. Wow. I've seen that happen all the years I've been on the railroad. You guys got good inspectors. Well, they go out there and they lean on them. They'll follow them. Oh, you didn't have your safety glasses on. You didn't do this, you know, or or you didn't check the oil in the truck yes. before you pulled off, you know, just nitpick at you. And, and the thing that's crazy about it, too, is a, I think a common public perception is that these entities are so big that surely 
there's there's measures in place to make sure these types of things happen but when you realize that no they operate in a lot of sense like most businesses operate they're trying to find ways to save money and they're trying to find ways to make the most money possible i mean railroad drayage in the north in the northeast and the and, and really in the midwest is super super big money maker and so obviously what we see here is we see this oversight on like it almost looks like a purposeful oversight mm -hmm. in order to not only make the not only to make more money but also to make the current administration that we have in office seem more productive seem more productive and have a higher economic yield okay can i say this okay now back when carl taylor was in charge everything was done right well then the railroad bought him out then they started hiring people off the streets that didn't know nothing about railroads and put them in management they were called the enforcers then uh okay now where i worked at us four guys chopped 150 cars for bad wheels they was running a, a wheel train every day to replace these wheels they come out and they ask what do we got to do to make this problem go away fix it that's our job you hired us to do a job they said, can you go on a computer and take these out? And I says, this is a federal document. You do not falsify federal documents. And uh, numerous times, quite a few people, they try to call Hersham into signing off on a federal document just so they can run their train. If you uh, go out there, you do your job, and you get what they call rips, you, know, you find bad cars in the train, they want to hold an investigation on you for delaying that train, even though that the public safety depends upon good inspectors, even the railroad safety for the employees depends upon good inspectors to do their job, but they like to take the dice and roll them and gamble. Man. Wow. So what, and, and that really lends well to something I was going to ask you, but it sounds like you've really, you've really already answered it, is that supposedly there were multiple CCT uh, footage, uh, uh, piece, pieces of footage that were recovered from different towns where up to 20 miles in advance of the derailment, the, the faulty bearing, the one that was supposedly responsible for the derailment, was yeah, on that fire. Was that was picked up on the indicator. It only takes a half mile before a bearing can burn off. That was picked up, but they decided to take that. Instead of pulling over like they should have, they decided to run with it. Now, another thing. Now you got your federal government, the FRA, Federal Railroad Administration. They cut way back on them. During the Obama administration, you have one... FRA inspector for the east side of Ohio from Cincinnati all the way to Toledo. Now, when you cross the Michigan line, they got one FRA inspector that handles all of Michigan going up to Sarnia, Canada. Now, on the west side, you got one FRA inspector. West Virginia, You'll have two inspectors. Kentucky, too, they cut way back on all their inspectors. They say they could do it all on computer now, but you can't do an inspection properly on a computer. They depend upon cameras and their uh, wheel detectors, but they cut back on their FRA. They're the ones that are supposed to enforce it. Now you get one guy that's covering uh, 400 miles, <laughs> <laughs> he can't be everywhere at the same time. The railroad knows this, so they, they pull their stunts. So they get caught, they pay the fines. So that brings up three questions from, from, from me. One, for our listeners who may or may not understand the responsibilities of, a, of an FRA in, inspector, uh, what exactly were they responsible for in the past one two what is wrong with that um the, the idea that everything 
can be checked remotely because you were just saying that some some people were were asking or pushing the issue of turning off those notifications is is that what i understood yes so first i guess the first question what is an fra inspector traditionally do what what are their roles and responsibilities and why is going from 40 in a tri-state area to one is is one of the numbers that i heard why, why is that dangerous they see the fra inspector they work for the federal government they are supposed to enforce the rules the safety rules on the railroad to make sure these trains are running safely but they got them spread so thin they can't do their job properly. They might be at Cincinnati for a week and come up to Lyme, Ohio for a week and go over to Willard, Ohio, then go to Toledo, Ohio. In the meantime, what's going on back in Cincinnati now that they know that he ain't going to be here for another six weeks or two months? What's going on in Walbridge when they know he ain't going to be here for another six months? So they got them spread too thin. They're doing whatever they can to save money. It's all about money. All right. So, the, Josh. And, and yeah, so just to give the listeners and, and a little bit of an idea, because this is kind of what I'm hearing, uh, what the FRA was is like what department DOT is for over the road drivers, where if you have a, let's say, give I'll give an example. Like if you have a 48 foot flatbed, it's 102 inches wide, it's 102 inches high. That's the height and the width requirements. If you go outside of those requirements, you have to have some sort of permit and you have to pay for that. And it has to be there. But if you don't, DOT is supposed to shut you down and, and until you get those permits in place. So think about it from this perspective of the FRA, they have all these people in place to make sure that these things are happening. And they're having all these people in place to make sure that everything's running smoothly, but ultimately everything's running safely. And, now, right. and when you cut it down to one, that's, the, that's like that you, you've placed way too much burden upon that one individual to cover that 400 mile basis because 400 miles is a, oh my goodness, that is a significant amount of coverage uh, for just one individual and a lot of oversight can happen. And you surely wouldn't want that to happen with DOT because let's say that that person who doesn't fit that height requirement, if they go under a bridge, they could cause damage to the bridge and they would that you would have all sorts of issues with insurance and everything. But yeah. That happened up here two weeks ago. Had one that uh, knocked out the bridge going across 75. He was too high. So I've got a, the third question I wanted to follow up on there was, so now that we see that the FRA has been, was reduced by Obama and, 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 and Trump did a little bit of changes too that they want to pick up, but really you've got to look, go back to uh, the Obama era deregulation there. And so, just don't let people play with you on that. The next question is, obviously we see this lack of oversight and you said something interesting earlier, just deal with the fines, be as efficient as possible, deal with the fines and move on. But the problem right. is it, that that mentality kind of reeks of, of what we saw with them venting the vinyl chloride into the air as though this is simply a fine issue. And then they, they followed up with that town for 25 grand was the first thing that they decided to give to the town. Everyone got upset about that and offered the company offered a million. Is this an endemic issue where those who are in charge, I'm not talking about the operators, I'm talking about the corporate structure. Does, does it seem like there's an endemic issue where there's no accountability for the people past a certain level on the corporate chain? That is correct because they're more worried about their shareholders than they are the public and the <laughs> and the safety of their employees. So that's really, really, really tragic. And that uh, so something about about us on this show generally we do have a diversity of opinion, but I think most of us here are are more for deregulation only in the sense of increased responsibility. Only because if they can get away without paying restitution to the people of Ohio, then this is just gonna happen again. So I, I, I wanna ask you this, 
there are calls now in Congress to um, apply a very specific type of braking system for the rail cars in general across America. I want to ask that, you, because we, we, we talked about this earlier, it sounds like it doesn't really matter about these new brakes. That's not the issue. It's the corporate structure, isn't it? That's correct. But the new braking system is still experimental. They're still exper experimenting on that new braking system. So what what is so special about about this this these new brakes for trains? Why is there a push for that? Do you have any any knowledge or any comment on it? Uh, not too much, but it's still experimental. My knowledge on it would be they're, they're they're doing whatever they can to cut jobs, to save the railroad money. See, whenever they come out with something, oh, I'll give you an example. Okay, when I started out there, we had three hundred employees. When I left. In 2014, they had 100 employees. And uh, now, that's just the shop that I work in, or uh, the district, Wabridge. Now they have 40 employees. Mm -hmm. They used to have a three-man crew on it. You actually had a five-man crew on the engine. You had two guys in the caboose and three guys on uh, the engine. If they had a problem, the guys in the caboose would walk towards the head end, and the guys in the engine would walk towards the rear end and meet in the middle and uh, figure out what the problem is. Now, they got two guys, an engineer and a brakeman. They're trying to get that to just one guy, just the engineer. That's, that's with, with their new With their new system, if they have a problem, it could be 10 below zero. That engineer's got to stop that train, get out there and walk. And most of these engineers, they're up in their 50s, late 50s, 60s, maybe in their 40s. And they're just they're doing whatever it can to save the money. You see, the railroad has a lot of pull in the government. I don't think anybody's ever going to buck that system with the railroad until you get the guy in charge of the Department of Transportation to actually do his job. Put somebody in charge of transportation that knows transportation, that knows the railroads, that knows your ships, that knows your airlines, that knows your trucking. Yes, because... It, you can't have Congress do everything. He's got to sit back and do his homework. Exactly. He's got to go out and talk to people. He's got to set up meetings with these here uh, managers of these railroads. He just can't, you know, push it off on somebody else, keep pushing it off. Absolutely. And so that, that right there is the nail on the head when you have bureaucrats who are elected or unelected who are running this i mean the, the whole new braking system the ecp brake is electronically controlled pneumatic brakes for those who have any engineering knowledge it's just another brake it's a it's a better mousetrap but Correct. but the problem is not the it, it's it's not the equipment is it, it, it it's, it's a it's a it's a corporate structure with irresponsibility where their buddies that they've lobbied in Congress will never hold them accountable. I mean, that's what I hear. Correct. That is correct. Uh, let me ask you this. What has become the state of our <clears throat> rail system over the past 40 years compared to say, like before then of what it was? Well, I tell you, back in the 90s, from uh, 91 to probably 97, 98, the rail system was in great shape, but it cost them a lot of money. They got rid of all them people that were pushing to do their jobs, to, even in management, even upper echelon. They were investing a lot of money in the rail system, they had rail inspectors. They rode the rail and inspection cars. They've done this constantly. The railments dropped 75% uh, back then. 
Now that is all that just went away because they are out to make money. I mean, that's all fine, well, and dandy. I'm all about making money, but there has to be consequences when stuff like this happens. Because I mean, by your estimation, I hear and many others, this was entirely preventable, was it not? And yeah, highly. Yeah, it? that would have been all well, the inspectors that inspected the train. Would have seen that bad bearing walking down if they did their inspection properly. And when it hit the indicator and the indicator said that bearing was bad, you had problems, they would have pulled that train over, walked back, took a temp stick, put that temp stick that there will tell you the temperature if it melts, it's the, the wheel's done. It has to be thrown out. But they did not do that, did they not? follow the safe job procedure. If they would have followed that, that would have never happened, but it would have cost them time because they would have had to stop the thing, have somebody go back there, walk that train, make the cut, pull that train ahead, have another crew come out of the yards, grab it from behind, and take it either into the yards or put it in the siding, put the train back together, then they would have been on their way they wouldn't have had all this confusion. They did not follow their safety procedures at all. As soon as they detected that, they should have stopped that train when it hit the second detector. That tells you there's a problem, but they didn't do that. Somebody had to give orders to tell that crew to keep going. There's, put this, this investigation is going to go on for a while. I have a question for you because you you were in the railroad for so long and you said in the 90s that you had a 75% decrease in derailments. In your That's opinion, correct. in your opinion, um this can be done very safely, maybe with less profit, but it can be done safely with profit for the railroad companies. Can it can it not? Yes, it can. They was making money back then. See, they got to take care of their shareholders. That's what their main thing is, their shareholders, their shareholders. It's too bad because I, I would think that if you could uh, you know, propose the fact that you are safe and that there you have fewer accidents and the employees are taken care of well, that would be a, a great investment. In my opinion, I would want to invest in something like that. Well, if, if I could butt in. Oh, sorry. Could I give you an Example before you know she here I give an example. Okay, I come into work, I drove around the back of the yard, come through, and I looked at this stone train. And I said, "Oh my God, this is overloaded. It had ballast on it, which is probably a uh, two inch by three inch rock." And I stopped off the yard master. I said, "You're not going to run that train tonight, are you?" He says, "Oh no." I said, "That train needs to be put back in the stone facility." And unloaded, I says, there ain't no center plate clearance. There ain't no side bearing clearance. I said, that's a derailment waiting to happen. Five o'clock in the morning, they had a crew on the engine. They called me out to give an air test. I told the crew, I said, call a cab. I said, this train ain't getting going nowhere. So it's back in the yard and you guys uh, get these cars down to normal, unload, get a scoop, scoop this stone off. I said, what's going on, an overpass? I said, and a rock falls off going across the expressway, goes through somebody's windshield. I said, somebody's going to get, someone could get killed. I said, that train could derail because you don't have no side bearing clearance, which that controls the train shifting from right to left, you know, when you ever see the cars rock. And uh, then I go, went back to my office. I get a phone call. I got fired seven times before I got off the shift. I come, I went home. I just blew it off, you know, because they can't fire me over that. And uh, before I went in the shift, the general car foreman calls me. He says, that was a real good call. He said, you did a good job calling that. He said, they put it back into the plant. It was overloaded. You were correct. But the people in transportation, you're fired. You're fired, you know. So <laughs> does that tell you a little bit how they operate? You, you strike me as a, as a man that doesn't take a whole lot of gumption from anybody. <laughs> no, no well, I, was a dist I was a district chairman for the union for 10 years, too. So, 
Yeah, I was going to say, uh, going to the point that they're all about making the profit, uh, what did we just see with almost these near railroad strikes that happened? That whole entire, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but a big part of that was pay time off for employees uh, on the rail. Right. And, no, and the railroads didn't want to pay for it uh, because they were trying to say, like going to his point, if, they, if we pay well, for it, it's going to cost more money. Well, see, the, the, the people in transportation, if you have a doctor's appointment, which the doctor sets the appointment, not you, and you go in there and tell them you got to take off to go to the doctors, they hold that against you as uh, marking off. Even though if you have a doctor's appointment, you bring a doctor's excuse in it, they hold that against you. And if you get three of them against you, then uh, they pull you out of service and you're automatically out of service for 30 days. And if you accumulate uh, three of them within a year, they'll fire you. But you'll get your job back. And that's all the guys wanted was time off to go to the doctors. Or if the wife had to go to the doctors or if the kid, that's it. They just, you know, one day or two days, whatever it takes, they, they weren't asking for much. No, they weren't. That really comes down again to the core of accountability. Um, one of the things, and I want to put this to you, uh, well-informed, as we're calling you. Uh, wouldn't it be better than fining these people, you know, these, these large companies, wouldn't it be better than fining them to have them pay restitution, i.e. two, four, five-fold, what is considered the damage done, even to the railway workers i mean to to a point because you have this this mentality of i can get slapped on the wrist financially and then you can bake that into the cost of doing business and that fine money doesn't go to the people who are injured it it just it goes to the government correct wouldn't it be a yeah, lot better if, if they had to pay restitution if it hurt yeah. Yes, out of their pocket. They should get here. I'll give an example. When I hired out of the railroad, we had a guy who was doing his job correct. He had the tracks locked out, had the switches thrown, put his locks on them, had his blue flags up, commenced to going down and uh, working the train. Well, he gets to the part and he calls the yard master. Well, this train ain't uh, put together. You got a gap in it. Well, in the meantime, the crew up at the east end picked the switch. He had a thin flange on a wheel, picked the switch, it went in there, hit these cars, coupled the guy between the cars, between the two knuckles. He was squished between the knuckles. And it's like, I don't know, it's like nothing to the railroad, you know, they paid the family, you know, and that was it. You know, nothing was ever said. That's really true. So, right. And the worst part of it is, is that they're not changing. I want to go around the room. Any final questions or thoughts? Because we said 30 minutes and we've, and we've kept you longer than that. But I want to thank you so much for your time. Any other thoughts, thank folks? You. Just thank you. Because as somebody who works the, the, I don't work railroad drayage or drayage coming in from the ports. I work, like I said, I predominantly work OTR and open deck. And so just hearing this fresh perspective about railroad drayage, and all the different things that happen on the rail is very, very fresh for me. So thank you. You're welcome. Well, well informed. I want to thank you so much for coming on and uh, we really appreciate it. If you have any final thoughts on the, on the Ohio derailment, we'd love to hear them. And, but that will sign you off. I won't give that report to you. I'm up at the cabin right now and I stay in touch with uh, two of my buddies that are FRA inspectors and they keep me informed. We had another one two days after that up in Michigan. Van Wert, 50 cars derailed. I don't know if you guys heard about that one or not. <laughs> I've heard about quite a few. There were a couple down here in Texas as well. Well, a lot of it's due to not doing their jobs proper. That could all be prevented. And I blame a lot of it on the government. Well, God the government will, will see a change it. shortly. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, they, I, I doubt it. But the government does not hold the, the railroads accountable for what they do. It's like the old Wild West, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a sad state of affairs. But and it like just ain't the railroads. I worked on the ships, too, yeah, on the lake freighters.
inspecting them. So it just ain't the railroads. <laughs> well, it's it's part of human nature. Thank right. you so much for coming on, sir. We really appreciate you. Yes, well, you guys you have much. a nice day. You're welcome. Thank you very much. You as well, sir. Thank you. Thank you, thank hey, you. Hey, send, send us some warm weather up here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right, have a good, have a good uh, day. Thank you. You as well. You as well. Bye. Thank you. Bye. All right. All right. So let us go ahead and debrief. That was quite a conversation. So that was amazing, actually. That was some very good insight, some very good information. You enjoy that? Yeah, thank you. So for those of you who don't know, Mr. Steve is is friends with Well-Informed. Again, we're calling him that for his anonymity's sake. But uh, he does work up north. If you didn't figure that out, I'm not letting the cat out of the bag. But, but, but. Uh, we really, really appreciate his time and testimony and message us, by the way, if you have something on a story that we're talking about or going to talk about soon or have talked about, let us know. We would love to uh, so. hear from, from y'all. So moving over to the chair of theology, we have a short amount of time before we wrap up today. I want to ask you, what does the Bible say about restitution? Well, I'm going to... Uh... In the Old Testament, we, if we go to Exodus chapter 22 and you look at verse 1, look at verses 3 through 6 and 14, it talks about when a man steals another person's ox or his sheep, if he sells it, he slaughters it and he's caught, he has to make restitution. Um, you can say the same thing if a man is, is, has cattle and he's grazing his livestock and he doesn't pay attention to them and they go into another man's field, he has to pay restitution. If a fire breaks out, whoever's responsible for that fire, if it causes damage to another person, there's restitution that has to be paid. So the principle of restitution is is scriptural. And so restitution does need to be paid here. My concern after listening to him is who's going to pay it? Okay, so we do know that the, the derailment was caused because somebody wasn't doing their job. But whose choice to burn off the... The chemicals and yeah. what damage if the the burning off didn't take place and they handled it like the railroad was supposed to be would the railroad be you know liable. responsible yeah so who's going to be liable in this this well, is going to be the question and i have i i'm very sorry to say this I'm, I'm i'm afraid a lot of people might not get what they deserve i agree and the, the real frustrating thing about that is is that 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 car those cars were full of the vinyl chloride and they were not labeled, marked, or transported in the hazardous material containment that was required for the nature of what was in those cars. And so unfortunately, it still falls on the railroad. Even if it does, it still falls on the railroad. And the government needs to keep their ding dang fingers where they belong and saying, fix it. Instead of telling people how to fix it, they need to say, fix it, or there will be a problem. Instead, they say, have these electronically controlled pneumatic brakes and have this, have that. It has nothing to do, as always with government regulation, it has nothing to do with what caused the problem, which is systemic corruption in a group of people who always get bailed out by the people who are making the laws. If they fix the brakes, guess what's gonna happen? They say, well, we did fix the brakes, but they did. But the problem was, wasn't the brakes. It was the bearings and it wasn't the bearings. It was how long they were riding those bearings. So the government needs to get their fingers out of the business and instead just eat out restitution. Well, you've heard the guy in the e from the EPA, the guy that runs the EPA say that the well water is OK to drink. It's all OK. You need to trust the government. Well, yeah. here's a concept. Why don't we take a glass of water out of somebody's well that's close to where all of that ran off happened, give it to him and set it on his table and say, drink that glass of water and see what he does. See if he pushes it away or see if he drinks that glass of water. Liar! <laughs> Yeah. What do you think he's going to do? You think he'll drink that glass of water? Who, who Please, believes no, he's going to no, drink it? Not no. me. Exactly. 
<laughs> I only have one thing to say to him if he does drink the water. <laughs> Papa Booey. Oh, that's the wrong one. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. <laughs> but that that is the problem. That is the problem. Is that they will not they will not sleep in the bed that they're making other people sleep in. Right. They are not making people sleep in the, they're making other people live with consequences that they are generating because they have not upheld their structure. The government's job and duty is to protect people. And so I want to ask you, the chair of philosophy, again, because we're wrapping up for the day here. I want to ask the chair of philosophy, how should we Christ as Christians hold that, that standard? Because we want freedom. As I told uh, uh, well-informed, we want our freedom. We want to have freedom, but freedom does not come for free. It comes with responsibility. How do we go about creating a system that punishes irresponsibility and therefore allows freedom? So I know I've been quite, I've been Silent. very quiet. I've been processing a lot of things and see, I find that, sorry. In this case, greed was this, the main problem in most of the issues found in this in greed easily. And I think money, because, you know, smokers, when they raise the money on cigarettes, they didn't stop. They just went broke. Yeah, that's the only thing that stopped them. They just they, they were just broke. That's it. They didn't stop, though. So I don't think at this point we've lived. We, we're in such a world where money moves everything, you know, and my man with this whole situation, it seems kind of weird that they burned it off. But if I take into account that cartel uses trains to move drugs, mm -hmm. it doesn't seem too far fetched that there might be something else in those trains that probably wasn't supposed to be there. You know, no one has, has said that yet, but, you know, tinfoil, tinfoil hat on. I mean, that, that's always like a possibility. Hey, and I forgot mine, dude. <laughs> you friend, he was, he was just like, oh, oh, my God. Man. Oh, oh. <laughs> okay, anyway, but, <laughs> I don't have that on the soundboard. But just so we have that, that driving force is human greed. Mm -hmm. Should not we be thinking about instead of regulation we should be thinking about punishment or bad behavior i think also john arthur because I, you know it just really bothers me it bothers me that we are putting men and women in situations where they have to choose because of the almighty dollar I really think a safe environment, that would be something I would want to invest in. And that would be something it, when a person goes to work and they feel like their their life is valued and their opinion is valued, they, you actually get a better worker. You actually, and I think you create a better environment. And, and I'm very impressed with what he said in the 90s when they had all these safety issues in place and people followed them, 75% less derailments. That speaks volumes. And yeah. I, I'm very disappointed. I'm very disappointed that um, corporate America and, you know, investors, it's all about the dollar at all costs, no matter what. Well, well, from what he said, you know, he was talking about the people that were hiring on that were just from the streets, uneducated. Well, there's a reason for that. The people on top want the other people to be dumb. So there's nothing outcome from that, right? So if I hired a dude to come Let's say if I hired a dude to come mow my lawn, but he's knowledgeable on what he's doing and he knows that gas is rising, the transportation of moving the lawnmower, using all the material, gas is going to be expensive. So he charges me. I don't want you. I want the kid from next door that really doesn't know about the gas. That really doesn't know. You, do, you have to pay for knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. You have to pay for knowledge. And if and it, and it's cheaper. If I'm going to hire somebody off the street, it's because I can get them for a cheaper dollar. But the but problem is when they die. The railroad's going to just go in shambles because there's they're not educating the younger ones. You know, we talk about discipleship in the church, right? How the younger should teach, how the older should teach the younger. Well, it's the same as if I was in a business. I would want the people below me to see how I run the business, to see how I treat my employees. So when I pass on, there is still something to keep going. I will tell you this. 
when he talked about the railroad company being self-insured. Yikes. They do a risk to reward type internally. No, uh, there's going to be a risk to reward. So if you go back to any kind of construction back in the early 1900s when they did not have the safety procedures, when they were going to build a, a dam or a bridge, they would actually take into consideration how many men were going to die yes. in the process. They really did. Yep. And I'm going to tell you right now, if the railroad is self-insured, they have a risk to reward system in place saying we can take this risk we're going to get this reward something happens we can pay it off and that's where and that's where i'm really driving i think our philosophy is all screwed up oh, on yeah. this the way our culture has has ultimately adopted a very corrupt philosophy our corporate culture yes. because there's been no accountability if there was personal not corporate personal accountability and i know that's what s corps and, and and some of these other structures are meant to mitigate now lcs i understand that i'm a business owner i get that but it goes beyond just your general corporate protection from accidents this is malicious this is malicious activity on the part of the company where they, you have a chronic issue there should be like an embezzlement of the public trust. I, I don't know how exactly that, that would all work, but these people are actively breaking laws. Maybe that's the s simplest way to break it down. They're actively breaking laws and they're telling their employees to, that's conspiracy. Yeah, and, and, and this isn't capitalism, this is corporatism. Where the government is in bed with the- Correct. With the companies. And, and, and their, their reason for taking these people off the streets is easy because what they do is they take people who are not informed on what should and shouldn't be done, and it's easier to twist their arm to say, like, um, take things off the books or do this in order to put these cars back on the tracks and run them down the track instead of keeping them off. Or let me go on here and I'll go ahead and remove it off the computer and we'll run it down the track so the company can make the money and boom, who's, it's just like when I was an inspector for, you know, doing in, in uh, a weld shop, the shop did a lot of deep down hole stuff in deep water, you know, man, I'll tell you what, I was like this guy as far as an inspector goes, because my name was on it, on it. And who, when they have an accident, who do they come to? The person whose name is on the inspection, man, because inspectors are the ones that get hammered. Yeah. And that should be the culture on that. And that's and that's something where you, you've really nailed it on the head. We have this pseudo-capitalism, which is really socialism under the stripe. And what I mean by that is when there's no accountability for the individuals who are running the larger companies and there's no financial accountability they can be bailed out that is a pseudo government organization it, it is by default and so what what i what i want to get, go to the chair of politics and i want to get your reaction on this is that like pete butt gig is so focused and i, and I know it's Buttigieg. i know it's Buttigieg. it's butt gig anyway pete butt gig is more focused on the racism of an all white construction crew, which I have never seen, by the way. I've never seen an all white construction yeah, I would crew. Like to, I would like to see that. See that. I have never, never seen never. that. I've been on many construction sites. Yeah. And they the all look only like you. White dude, <laughs> man, is probably the architect. And he's, man, he's just probably just sitting afar with a glass of lemonade. And that's about it. I have never. So I'm just saying, like, like, like so, so he's, he's giving the spiel. He's giving the spiel while not responding to this and potentially, who knows, conspiracy theory head on, who knows, maybe he is telling them to burn that off. So we've got these politicians who are more focused on re-election than actually dealing with the restitution that's needed in Palestine. What should the government's role be here? Well, you see what the issue is, is what the gentleman said. The gentleman said that these people have zero experience in this industry. Like what, what qualifications does Pete Buttigieg have be able to be the head of transportation? 
He has zero qualifications for that crap. Period. Right? This is what this is what you see in education too. There's people who are the like the head of the school districts who have who are politicians who their entire background is in law and in politics and it has nothing to do with actually being a teacher or being an educator of some sort instead you just have people who are fulfilling an who are, agenda who are, who are fulfilling an agenda and i don't know why the people who elect these people or the people who make these people get these positions like that type of structure because those people are the most out of touch people possible and i think the worst part about it is and this is what happens with political negligence is when you don't actually talk to the people who are doing the gosh dang job mm -hmm. and so that's what that gentleman also said these pete Buttigieg is not going out to ohio and speaking with the rail workers and look, and looking at what's happening right uh, yeah these pe these uh these these heads of education they're, mm -hmm. they're not going to look at what's happening in these public schools and what a teacher goes through on a day-to-day -day basis they're not doing these things so they're so they're out of touch with that now does that mean that they have to have now here's a i want to put a caveat does that mean that they have to go to these things or do they have to inspect these things to be able to have a knowledge about it no they don't you can have an outside knowledge but it's like what you'll say with anything you can teach about something right mm -hmm. but you're always going to have a different knowledge when you're involved with it correct and it and so i think that's what's really lacking in politics and especially with what we saw in this scenario obviously the Pete Buttigieg had zero experience in transportation otherwise he would have known that burning that that material off is not the right play and it's going to create problems yeah like how obvious is that how obvious is that that releasing phosphine gas into the air and, and, and maybe i'm not pronouncing that correctly but you're literally releasing a world war one era pathogen or chemical weapon rather on Ohio, you just you just detonated a trench warfare bomb but on Ohio. Let me tell you, people are going to say he's not a chemist. How would he know? Well, that's his job. I mean, he's been appointed. And if he if he doesn't know it, he doesn't he shouldn't have have the job. Period. Exactly. That's what Josh is just going to. And the fact that I'm, the fact that well informed said that they already had a hazard protocol in place yes that would have been safer there's a thousand ways they could have done that differently but that's how uh, scuffed the political that's also how scuffed the corporate structures in america and this is when you see capitalism and on its ugly side when it's being run in the worst manner possible yes is no accountability there's no accountability but also there's a value of younger thought and younger people in the corporate structure and like the heads of corporate structures and so because a lot of there's a for some reason there's a popular perception that it's the old guys who have had old money who are just running these companies and for some of those companies it's true but for a lot of it uh the people who are getting pay raises and the people who are making their way fluidly up the the, the chain of command at these companies they're young people so and i can at least speak from experience i know someone who worked for a company for 39 years and he was probably the most experienced person when it came to oil and gas ever, that I've ever met. I've talked with other people in oil and gas and I've never met a person to this day that knew more than him because he actually knew stuff about the rocks. He knew stuff about the fossils. He knew stuff about everything, every aspect that you could ever think of. And he wasn't a engineer. He wasn't a business guy. He's someone that's been doing it for 39 years. And they refused to give him a different title. They refuse to, because they know that that means he's going to need to get paid more. So he's just he retired. Yeah. And I've experienced that too. I mean, and I know, and I know you have, you and I have at different times been on the receiving end of some of that on some level, on like a small level in my time, I spent a brief stint in technical corporate America and people would say like, oh, he's going to show us the the new way forward and it's this idea that somehow 
young people are smarter than old people. And I really don't get that. I really don't get that. Like, I, I understand that there are bright and up and coming people, right? And hopefully, hopefully you, you aspire to be that. But also there's this weird thing of, oh, they're, they're young. Therefore, they know they can teach us new things. It's like, no, 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 no. Where's the intergenerational wisdom? And they try to, they try to use this term in, in business, unfortunately. <laughs> Terrible term. It's called projectability. Yeah. That's a, that's a, that's a KPI, I guess you could call it and how they would grade you. And if you're deserving of a raise and they don't, they don't say the loud, they don't say the quiet part out loud, but age is involved in that projectability. Yeah, it is. So from the chair of economics, just to wrap it up, I'll pretend I'm sitting over there in that chair and not in the producer's chair. Uh, when you consider how preventable this was, I think it's time to make it hurt and not just for uh, Norfolk Southwestern is a mouthful to remember uh, that the rail company responsible for this is not just for, for them, but also for the individuals who are criminally responsible. There should be a full NTSB investigation to say, all right, who's been saying, who's been saying our job is freight, not fixing cars. Oh, you were involved with this specific car. Let's get every skew and let's have a, you know, you want to talk about January 6th about getting people who were in that zip code and putting them in jail? How about this? How about the people who were involved in setting off a World War II chemical weapon or World War I chemical weapon in Ohio? Let's look at those people for a moment. How, how about we spend that kind of vigor on those people who are criminally, corporately, and systemically responsible? And let's go after them civilly. Let's take away their second home. Let's take away, if it's just their home, let's sue them for everything they have. And then you, we use that. The government doesn't get to touch it. We use that. We give it to the people of Palestine. Okay. I mean, I take away their corporate chairs. A hundred percent. Tell them, look, you cannot do this without a consequence. And that way you, and I'm not talking about actually putting people's heads on stakes, but I'm saying there used to be a day when we would put people's heads on pikes and sit them out on the front of a, of, of a village in town and say, this is what happens when you mess with the people of this village, of this town. I'm not saying that these people deserve that, but I'm saying there needs to be a symbolically a similar gesture. It needs to be potent. People need to see the difference of, oh, this is what happens when I violate the public trust and cause untold damage and harm. Just my two cents. With that said, if you like this podcast, like, comment, share, subscribe, all those good things. Thank you for over 170,000 downloads as of right now on the podcast itself. YouTube, what's going on, guys? I'm, I'm sorry. We're just talking about the train derailment. I mean, come on. Let Man, some of the views come watching, in. Stop deleting them. If you're watching anime and you're getting... Oh my gosh! Man, they don't. I mean, they don't like we, me when they. We put, didn't hear you, buddy. When, they, when you put me on shorts, dude. I mean, they don't like me. Yeah, yeah I, I I saw saw that one short of me. I got a fifty fifty ratio. Split the room. All right. With that said, if you didn't like this podcast, no views. you know where that button is, and uh, hit it twice, just for good measure. Thank you so much. We love you. Bye bye. Bye. Uh, all right. All right. If you're still here, what's bye. wrong with you? But we're going to go around the room and we're going to talk about what is the most frustrating part of this Ohio derailment story for you. What is the most frustrating thing? I'm, I'm sure that it'll be fun on a political level. Yes. For political reasons and not for. The way I've been raised is that I help people, right? So the frustrating part is for me is that I can't go down there myself and help the people that is going on and help the local church and what they're doing and what efforts is being done over there. Even if you did, it, it really wouldn't be getting to the core of the problem. The damage is done. Yeah. What will end up getting to me is who will end up getting the blame and it won't be the ones that are actually responsible. Correct. They'll be looking for a scapegoat. Yep. This has been my problem with business as a whole. There's never a, it's never okay just to have what you have and it's never good enough. I, I always hated that about business. And I'm not saying that we should be complacent, right? 
if we can do better, we can do better. But usually most what you'll see in business, especially in, in corporate America, is that it's never good enough and we got to do something outside the box and something that quite frankly is not ethical. It's not necessarily, it's illegal. It's not ethical. Yeah. See, I love outside the box thinking. And I think that's really important in business to be able to become more efficient and become better as a company, becoming better as a person. But when it comes to the cost of someone else, th and that's a really good segue for me for mine, I hate it that the people in Ohio are not going to get what they deserve because what's going to happen is, is they're going to pay a settlement and, or probably not even a settlement. It may or may not even be a class, class action lawsuit. We'll see. I hope they do. And I hope they win big. But what I'm afraid of is that it'll end up being fines and none of those fines go to the people. Right. I'm, I'm just saying it's like, that's why I hate fines. I think fines are terrible. I think restitution is awesome. You pay it right to the people and then you're done. But instead of paying the people and being done, we're going to go into a long drug out thing and we're going to find out health issues that carry on. And really if, if, if a court said $500,000 is what the inconvenience was for the individuals, if that's what they roughly estimated in, in future healthcare costs, whatever, they should pay 2.5 million to each person. That's restitution. When I say restitution, that's the definition. They should pay five times. They should pay five times. Those people should never have to work again. They should be beyond this. They should be gone and off in Tahiti, enjoying the rest of their life, even if they have lung issues for the rest of their life. These people should be taken care of and they should be given everything by the company, no, not the government, not the government, no, not us. Because really, when the government does it, the government is taking it from these people. It should come from the company that harmed them. Exactly. That's that's what it should be, but I don't think it will. With that said, like, comment, share, subscribe. Goodbye for real this time. Love you. Bye. Bye.